Hi, everybody, and welcome to this event uh, hosted by the DSA International Committee on Cuba's upcoming Families Code referendum. Uh, this is a, a exciting new uh, model we're trying out. We're going to do a lecture, we'll move into breakout rooms for discussion, and then we'll come back for Q&A. Uh, as I said before, if folks who haven't yet could make sure to add their chapter at the beginning of their name on Zoom so that I can sort you more easily while we are doing lecture, that would be very helpful. And I will now pass to Stephen, who can introduce himself a little bit further, but uh, thank you all so much for joining. And uh, I'll pass to Stephen, the co-chair of DSA uh, International Committee America Subcommittee. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, I just want to also appreciate all the work that Sam's done to bring this all together. Um, this is a really new kind of event for the IC and the IC Americas subcommittee in particular. So thank you, Sam. Um, I'm Steve Rizzo. I am the, one of the new co-chairs of the International Committee Americas subcommittee. Um, I'm also from Boston DSA and particularly the internationalism working group of that chapter. Um, so I'm gonna be introducing the families code a little bit. So if you didn't get to read all of the articles, that's fine. You'll still get a lot of information from me. Um, and I think that's everything you should know from me, but um, just give me one second now to get my uh, screen share up. All right, um, so one of the things about this constitutional referendum that a lot of people often get wrong right from the get-go is that it is called the Families Code and not the Family Code. Um, and this is a really important distinction that a lot of Cubans will, will kind of um, wag their finger at you for, partly because um, a, a lot of the changes are around the, the new kinds of, or the new kinds of family that are being enshrined in law. Um, so to give a little bit of background, um, Cuba's basic legal system is divided into a bunch of different sections. So things like the civil code, criminal code, health code, and the families code. Um, and there is already an existing families code on the books, which was drafted into law in 1975. Um, and part of what the Cuban legal scholars the Communist Party and um, others involved in the updating of the constitution have determined was that it is largely outdated because of its assumption of a nuclear family established around a heterosexual married couple. Now, um, the genesis of this new update to the family's code, part of the basic constitution of Cuba is a bunch of research that they did on families that already exist in Cuba. Like it wasn't an attempt to create an ideal kind of family and then legislate that for every person in Cuba, but there was an attempt to understand what kinds of families were already there. So this is actually an advertisement that uh, Granma the, the newspaper of the Communist Party of Cuba put out when it was doing this sort of basic research. So they were finding that there were already Cuban families in which um, a child lived with their grandparents or um, there were you know same gender couples with children. Um, there were situations where people like aunts and uncles were raising children or there were single families or um, you know, reassembled families, families with step parents, things like that. So um, some of the research that they found was that half of all Cuban households were headed by women. 30% of Cuban children were living only with grandparents. There was a rising trend, not just in Cuba, this is pretty much a, a global trend of cohabitation of couples living together without being married, often having children. Uh, there was a rising trend of households where both adults were working outside of the home. Families um, had various compositions, like I said, same gender parents, chosen families, um, all sorts of other uh, 
family members raising children. And they also found that there were a lot of families uh, with that needed care for people with disabilities. Now this goes in both directions, both children with disabilities, as well as elderly folks who were living in family situations who needed special care. Um, part of, let's see, uh, let's go just back to this for a second. Part of what they were finding also um, and trying to enshrine into basic law, again, was protections for these already existing modalities of family. And other aspects that came out of this were that there was partly due to like um, a relationship between feminist movements in Cuba and the Communist Party. There was greater attention to the need to legislate around domestic violence or gender-based violence. Um, so part of the new um, framework of law enshrined in the constitution is enshrining the right to family life free of violence. Um, there were things around surnames, like, you know, the previous family law had um, assumed that children would take the uh, father's surname when, you know, they had children. Um, this, the new law would allow children to choose or families to choose which surnames they wanted. Um, there was a replacement of language. The previous constitution had language around um, parents as having power over their children. And so there's a legal term called patria potestas. Um, and now instead of having this power over children language, there's one of mutual responsibility. Um, so there, there's a, a responsibility for parents to care for children um, and things like that. Um, also included in the new code are laws around uh, surrogacy and adoption. Um, in Cuban terminology, surrogacy is actually called solidarity gestation, which I think is an incredible turn of phrase. Um, in terms of adoption, not only could um, you know, heterosexual families adopt, of course now same gender families will be able to adopt, and they also enshrined, they, part of the research they found was that, um, you know, they, they wanted to enshrine as a basic right families who are unmarried but cohabitating to also have the same ability as married couples to adopt children. Um, so we would maybe call this something like common law marriage in the United States or a kind of like de facto marriage situation, um, but one that wasn't necessarily like bound to uh, a legal contract. Um, they enshrine no fault divorce into the new, um, the proposal for the family's code. And um, a few other really important things. One I think is an incredible socialist advancement, which is that it enshrines domestic work as labor. And this is not simply a motto that they're enshrining into the constitution, but um, one that has juridical consequences, especially in things like divorce. So if families are divorced and, you know, you had um, a partner who was a primary, you know, uh, going out of the house to make money and you had some, a partner who was home uh, doing domestic work, that work would need to be like compensated in the um, division of property. So, um, and finally, there was an attempt to address abortion rights in this family's code. And this is a little bit tricky because abortion is actually, I mentioned in the beginning that there's a number of different domains of law and abortion is considered a right under the, the health code um, rather than the family's code. But instead what they did was enshrined the unambiguous right of a woman to her body including the right to maintain or terminate a pregnancy um, as part of this, this new family's code. So um, that's a lot of the content that, that has now been developed as part of this. And what I think is really interesting is the manner in which this content has now come to its final, hopefully, draft. Um, and this is the process of popular consultation. So um, this happened in a variety of different domains in Cuban society. 
Um, I have a friend in Cuba who said that he had gone to three different popular consultations for the family's code, um, one of which was with his union in his workplace, one of which was in his uh, like local government, his neighborhood government. Uh, maybe we'd call it like a ward counselor would hold something um, up here in Boston at least, and uh, also in his communist party cell. Um, when these popular consultations were, were basically meetings um, where there would be a brief educational sort of component describing parts of the family's law. Um, everyone would have been given copies in advance and asked to read them as, as much as they're able. And then every person who came, whether or not they're a member of the Communist Party, it didn't matter, had the right to make their voice heard. And so the option was that they could propose to strike, amend, or add language to any provision, any number of provisions. Um, and they afterwards would be presented with a transcript of their proposal. And they'd have the right to amend that transcript if they felt that it didn't accurately reflect what they were trying to say. So um, some, some data on these popular consultations. Uh, in addition to what I said, um, the local government, the CDRs, the CDRs are committees for the defense of the revolution, which um, are a really interesting thing in Cuba. They're kind of a mix between um, maybe like a tenants union and uh, like a DSA chapter. Um, like if they were like one body, um, they're, they're like a, a sort of often based in like a single apartment block or a single, um, you know, block on the, on the street. Um, so 6.4 million people participated in these popular consultations, which is out of about 11 million people on the island. There was 79,192 popular meetings, including around 1,159 outside the island. And that would be for uh, Cuban expatriates living in places like the United States or in Mexico or wherever else. Um, 434,860 proposals were processed. So this is what I was describing before where someone could propose to amend, strike, or add language. Um, of those proposals, they found that about 48% of the text overall and 49% of the articles included in the Families Code were modified through popular consultation. And now the bill that is going to a referendum um, on the 25th in just four days is in its 25th version um, from the, the one that was originally proposed. So after that, um, it, they've, they've got to a point where they felt that it had gone through enough of the popular consultation. They also interestingly um, included what I'd call like sectorial consultation. So they invited particular advocacy groups of various kinds to consult on what they thought was important in the Families Code. So for instance, Cuba's main LGBTQ advocacy organization, its transgender advocacy organization, as well as maybe more reactionary groups like the Roman Catholic Church um, were invited as different kinds, of, and you know, like the Lawyers Guild and, and all of these sorts of different sites of society were asked to contribute their thoughts. Um, just as an example, uh, when the transgender advocacy organization in Cuba was consulted, um, it actually did produce changes to the verbiage. So there was some modification of language around pregnancy. Um, previously, it had included language like women intending to be pregnant, and now it includes language like people intending to be pregnant. Um, some of the feedback you know, was really more related to things like the civil code or the health code. So um, these are just the one example of something that, that kind of made it into there. Um, as I mentioned, the Catholic Church was consulted on this, and um, I think I'll get the, to that near the end. But after this, this period of consultation, they sent it to what are called the, the what's called the Assembly, uh, the National Assembly of Popular Power which is basically the unicameral, the, the single house um, Cuban Congress, um, where it was passed. Um, and that was July 23rd. I was in Cuba at the time. 
and people were really excited about that. Um, I couldn't find, I don't know if there was a, a, a roll call vote for that. I couldn't find anything about whether there was some margin in the, in the popular assembly, um, but it was passed. So now we're moving towards the referendum on the 25th. Um, the main source of objection to the Families Code is the Roman Catholic Church and uh, conservative religious groups. So um, the Cuban bishops released a statement this week asking people to vote no, saying it does not benefit the Cuban family, the introduction in our legislation of the contents of so-called gender ideology. So that's where they're coming from. Um, this is actually an advertisement from one of the liberal Protestant churches, the um, Martin Luther King Center, which had a much better take on this. Um, right now, they're saying that the um, polls indicate that around 61% of Cubans approve of the Families Code as it is currently written, and the um, basis for passing it would be 50%. Um, so it just needs a simple majority. And now, just to get very, very briefly into the reason for this whole process is that the, the party and the president, M Miguel Diaz-Canel, determined that um, changes of this magnitude really needed to be ratified through a popular referendum. Um, they needed to have buy-in from folks on the ground um, in Cuba. It couldn't just be something that they legislated from the top down. So that's a very brief introduction to the Cuban Families Code. Um, and at this point, um, oh no, I'll hand it back now to Sam. Thank you so much to Stephen for the wonderful introduction. So uh, in just a second, you're going to have all of the breakout rooms open. Uh, for facilitators, I have kept every facilitator in their own room. Some of you have some folks who are not from your chapter, so you may want to do a round of introductions to uh, confirm because there's some folks whose uh, chapters are not leading a breakout room. Uh, so we're going to go into breakout rooms and we'll be in breakout rooms for, uh, let's say, uh, until uh, 6.15, let's say 6.20, uh, 6.20 Pacific time, 9.20 Eastern. Uh, and we will uh, join uh, after that is done. We'll do a brief Q&A afterwards. So any burning questions, you can come back to the Q&A with them. So with that, I will pause recording and we'll go into breakout rooms. Uh, great job on breakout rooming, everybody. Uh, we will now uh, finish off with a little Q&A uh, with Steve. We'll, uh, share us, uh, answer any questions that folks have. Uh, we'd like to, because we're going to be able to, we're going to put this on a recording, if folks could make sure to type their questions into chat that they have so that uh, we can read them out loud and uh, answer them. And we'll, uh, we'll go through that for probably about 15 minutes, and then we'll start to wrap up. I'll also preface this by saying I'm neither a lawyer in the United States nor in Cuba, so <laughs> my answers will only go so far but I'm here to help. Uh, we have one question, which is Stephen, where are you a lawyer? <laughs> Nowhere. And if folks could uh, type their questions in stack so that we can make sure we can have a clean recording. Uh, we have one question, which is, do you have any good resources for learning more about CDRs? Sounds like a powerful organizing technique. Um, that is a great question. I don't. Um, I think I can talk to some comrades and, and see if I can dig something up. And perhaps we can send out a resources email as a follow up to this. Um, my main knowledge of CDRs was visiting them um, and talking to people in the CDRs. Uh, and it, so if you came late, that's the 
Committee for the Defense of the Revolution. They're very, very small organizing um, structures, often based out of apartment blocks or sort of like city blocks. Um, so very granular. And uh, they were also the, the they, they sort of function like kind of community service attendance union, but also like were mobilized as the counter protest to the July 11th protests, um, the pro-revolutionary protests. So they, they have a political mobilization element. Anyway. Um, we have a couple of questions from Andy. I only see two, so maybe uh, he's pacing a third one. Uh, but I'll first ask one, what role do those elected uh, play in the referendum process? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. Um, I mentioned before that a lot of the uh, popular consultations were held at the kind of neighborhood level. And those would be usually be held with like your equivalent of a kind of city councilor, like a ward councilor or something like that. Um, so you had those local electeds were kind of the front line of, of taking in the, the popular consultations. Um, it was also, I, I think they played some sort of role like in um, synthesizing some of the input. I am not extremely sure about that. But then of course the um, like con Congress type scale of the Cuban government then was the thing that kind of deliberated, drew its own kind of um, modifications of the constitutional changes and then um, eventually approved the final version that is now for a constitutional referendum, popular referendum. And then a second question, which is how is the information from the modification proposals incorporated into constitution changes? Yeah, that's another really good question. Um, and again, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to say that I, I don't exactly know. Um, but part of what happens is like, this came up a little bit in my group as well. Um, there is a sense in which having a communist party be the kind of soul of the government helps a little bit keep the ideological sort of um, North Star to some extent. So if you have a lot of like cranks giving, um, you know, if anyone's ever like run a meeting it's not an uncommon thing, no matter where you are. Um, so to kind of separate the, the, the signal from the noise, I think um, there was also some extent to which like education was part of this process as well. Something I didn't really mention that well in the introduction. Um, and then I think there was some weighing of the kind of like popular opinions as well. Um, again, this is this is all sort of happening at a scale of um, in, including a lot of like Cuban constitutional lawyers and politicians. And frankly, I, I don't know how to learn more about that. So um, my answer is not super great, but I, I hope that kind of clarifies a little bit of my understanding of that, that process. Uh, I'll go in the order that we've got them. So we'll come back to Andy's third question. But first, we'll uh, go with... One of the readings said that part of the opposition to the proposed changes is that some parents want to have custody over rather than responsibility for children, with children regarded as possessions within the family structure. Can you explain more how the proposed changes seek to transform rights or dynamics within? Yeah, um, so this is the, like the reading said, this, this has been a little bit of a controversial one, partly because um, I think the Catholic Church is also spreading some misinformation around this, um, partly because they have a very like conservative idea of the family. Um, and so part of the responsibility is that children are, are under the new constitution thought to have some degree of, I forget the exact legal term that they use, but like uh, progressive, uh, I think it's progressive autonomy. And this is to say that like the, the parent has responsibility over the child, but there are some things that the child can say no to, which is things like domestic abuse. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, domestic violence was one of the things that was being addressed in this constitutional code. Um, you know, things like 
uh, yeah, just various kinds of, like, let your imagination run about, like, what kinds of horrible things children would have to say no to in, in a family, and that's what this is meant to protect. Um, I think the custody over is largely coming out of, like, this, this much more conservative view um, in which, uh, you know, parents are, are considered to have absolute authority over their children. Um, and, you know, to be frank, I think part of the the social problems this is also responding to were from the special period in the 90s when there was massive economic problems and there was actually, you know, like um, prostitution and sort of sex trafficking happening. And so the idea is that this, this um, ability for children to, you know, say no to, to certain situations enshrined in law is, is part of the response to that. I hope that answers that question. So next we have the uh, long awaited third question from Andy, which is how can we use our understanding of the family's code referendum and how their constitution slash democracy works in our solidarity work with Cuba here? Um, I, I, so I, I can think of two ways of answering this question. And the, the first way that came to me is that's for you to decide. And that's why we're here tonight discussing it with our chapters. I think um, maybe a more direct thing would be to say, like, um, when we talk about this family's code constitutional change, as I hope you discovered tonight, you can sort of cut through a little bit of the propaganda around Cuba that we are often given, right? That like Cuba, Cuba is not a democracy, um, that it's some sort of like, a, you know, dystopic authoritarian regime. And we find that in many ways, Cuba's system, while different from our own, certainly is in fact a democracy. And so I think doing this kind of political education that we've been doing here tonight is one important thing that um, Cubans would appreciate, I think, to, to tell the truth about their country too. Um, in terms of solidarity work with Cuba, I would also say, um, join the IC. This is one of our priorities. Uh, Cuba solidarity work, um, learn how to do Cuba solidarity work with your chapter. And as the IC Americas subcommittee, that's something that I would be committed to helping you do. So um, reach out, apply to the IC, and, and let's get that sort of work off the ground. Uh, next question we have is, we had a great queue in our breakout room. What is the impetus to write a new family's code right now specifically? Um, I may have mentioned that there was a previous update to the constitution in 2019. So I think this is part of like the, um, what could we call it? Like legal housekeeping that a normal functioning society often does of its constitution. Um, and at the same time, as I mentioned, there was a sense in which um, folks were starting to think about the old family's code and the fact that it was really not reflecting the basic life of Cubans on the ground. And, and honestly, I think this is also um, due to the increasing um, awareness and advocacy for specifically feminist and LGBTQ issues in Cuba. Um, so there, there has been pressure from Cubans to make these sorts of changes. And I think the um, party and the government have been responsive to those changes, uh, to, that, to that pressure. When we have uh, curious if you could talk about how the Cuban government politicizes and mobilizes people for them to even care to be politically involved with this on such a large scale. That is a really fantastic question, and I'm glad that you asked it. Um, this is going to be one that I also really can't answer extremely well, but it, I'll also say that it's a question that I have myself. Um, I think part of it is having the, you know, revolutionary infrastructure, right? That, that there is a sense in which there, 
they had a successful revolution. There was an experience of that revolution, and they spent 50 years continuing to build out the infrastructure of that revolution. So things like the CDRs, the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, are part of how you keep people at a very granular level mobilized, right? Um, I think this is also an open question in Cuban society, to be quite honest, in so far as there's a sense in which um, people are asking, like, will the next generation stay mobilized for the revolution? Um, and again, like the people that I know who are like my age-ish, you know, um, are generally down, but at the same time, there's also real um, lack, right? Like the, the US uh, embargo, the blockade of Cuba has caused real material lack to the point that um, many people who I know who are both on the solidarity side and in Cuba saying that right now is some of the worst economic conditions since the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, partly due to the pandemic and the increased Trump sanctions. So. Um, I think that, that this is also just an open challenge right now, like even intra-Cuban discourse um, sees this as a challenge. So um, yeah, not a great answer, but um, I think that this is something that we need to be in dialogue with Cubans about to continue learning. I think we'll hold if there's any final question. I'll do one more and start to wrap up. Oh, here's a here's a big one. Uh, I will, we'll do these two and then I think we'll we'll wrap up. So, uh, one is how could slash should DSA respond to Cuban Americans who might disagree with this? Um, you know, that's a really good question too. Um, I would say that. Cubans in the United States are not homogenous. Um, and I think that's really important as well, because in just as an example, the work that we've been doing here in Boston has involved many Cuban Americans. Um, I think that, that you, we have to recognize that um, there were multiple waves of immigration from Cuba, often for many different reasons, um, that Cubans have different political ideologies, right? So like there are leftist Cubans. It, it is, I mean, from our comrade here in the chat, right? Like the, that, that that's, there's some degree to which Cuban Americans are in, engaged in these issues. Um, there is, on the other hand, a powerful, you know, exile community that is mobilized around the right. Um, I think part of it is getting in touch with the kinds of um, solidarity work, right, that that has the sort of local connections to Cubans in your area. Um, you know, I think that's... I, so this is not a great response to the question of like, how do you deal with the right wing? And I think that probably the best answer to that is like, it's it's difficult. It, it's really, it's gonna be really tough. Um, our comrades in Miami DSA um, have often sort of been bodily, physically threatened uh, for Cuba solidarity work. So um, I don't have a really good response to, to what you do to that, but I can say that there are, um, Cuban Americans out there who are willing to work with us on issues around Cuba solidarity. Uh, I apologize, I did miss one question. So we'll do these last two and then we'll wrap up. Um, uh, it may already have been spoken to within the law itself, but I'm interested, I guess we're interested in um, the Communist Party specifically. Is there already a Cuban communist position on queerness? Um, again, I think that this is an evolving discussion in Cuba. I think in general, there's an awareness that the sorts of rights being enshrined in the family's code are necessary for Cuban society, If partly because the, it's a fact. It's a fact in Cuba, right? Um, I also think that, um, 
at the same time there's like cultural elements of like you know machismo that that are counter veiling forces to that sort of recognition so i do think that it's not uncontroversial but at the same time i think the the movement towards enshrining rights to marriage as well as like um general awareness around trans issues as well and and the move to, to begin enshrining those sorts of rights in the constitution as well um, are evidence at least of some progress from the party on recognition of queerness um, as a you know dignified and, and valid form of life in Cuba. And I think we'll wrap up with this last question, which is are there any ways to get in touch with Cubans? Yes. And um, what I will say is that a project that is that was passed at um, last night's I see America's meeting um, that is moving on now to be considered by the steering committee of the International Committee is a general membership delegation to Cuba um, for DSA members. And so I would encourage you to keep on the lookout for that trip to sign up and get involved once you see that, because the best way to get in touch with Cubans is to go to Cuba. Um, you know. Um, so anyway, yes, do that. Wow, with that uh, big uh, big news dropping, uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up there. Thank you all so, so much for joining. Um, it was really wonderful to see so many people show up and uh, so many uh, folks helping organize contingents from their chapters. Um, I'd like everybody right now while I'm talking to open up this Google form uh, which is a feedback form to help us uh, let us know what went well with the event and what we can do better next time. Um, so I'm just going to pause here for a few seconds, use the captive audience before I tell you all you can leave. You're allowed to leave if you want, but I'm not going to tell you you can leave until I've given you a little bit of time to open up this and start typing into it. Okay, with that, uh, hopefully everybody's had a chance to open it. We'd love to get your feedback. We'll send out this link uh, as a follow up after the event as well. Thank you all so, so much for joining. And um, as Stephen said, there's a few opportunities for folks to get involved, joining DSA's International Committee, um, getting involved in Cuba solidarity work locally. If you came with a chapter that has a delegation, they should that had a delegation here, they should be able to connect you to any work that they're doing uh, locally as well. So it would be uh, it would be great to keep this going. Uh, and as we figure out how to do more stuff like this, help uh, participate and maybe organize a contingent of your own. So thank you all so so much. Uh, you're now free to go. And if uh, facilitators want to stay on for a second, we'll uh, we can debrief.